the Bible actually talks about God hating. God hates a, a proud spirit. Uh, uh, God hates divorce, the Bible says. So I'm um, using the term hate in the sense that we want to hate the things that God hates. Today's sermon is entitled, Why I Hate Religion. Why I Hate Religion. Maybe you didn't think of that this morning. You know, you're getting showered up and you're getting pretty and you're, you're shaving in front of the mirror or whatever. And you're thinking, I bet my preacher is going to talk about why he hates religion this morning. Maybe that didn't uh, come to your mind. but And I really think that this message today, brothers and sisters, what kind of church do you want? I think this message is going to get to the heart of it. Why did we start Foundation Bible Church 10 years ago in my parents' dining room? Why did we come together? What kind of church do we, do we want to be a church where we, where we sit around and very critical of everybody else around here, how they talk, how they dress, education level, whatnot? Or do we want to be a church where I'm just thrilled to see you I am a sinner saved by grace. I'm a son of God, and I'm looking at you. You are a child of the living God. You are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he loves you, and I love you, and I know you love me. Is that the kind of church we want? Is that a kind of, the kind of church we're battling to have? Let's uh, open our Bibles now to Matthew chapter 15. And think about... Guys, think about going forward, what kind of church do we want foundation to be? Matthew chapter 15. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. If you're having trouble finding chapter 15, just find chapter 14 and go one chapter farther. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. I was told this morning by my sister, think about what jokes you're going to make this morning. I did think about it. I thought that was okay. All right. Uh, Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Then some Pharisees, remember the Pharisees were like kind of a religious elite. Uh, they really cared about Israel. They really cared about God, the things of God. They were, uh, they were seen as very holy. They were leaders in their community. They not only had uh, religious influence, but they had political influence as well. So these are important people in their community. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem. So they traveled north to, uh, from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And it was not this idea of, of you got grimy hands and it was the idea of, it was a symbol of becoming holy before God. You dip your hands in the water, you wash your, you, you wash your hands. Uh, it was a religious kind of ritual. And uh, they said, why? Jesus, instead of looking at Jesus and all the good things he was doing, look, looking at all the people that were turning their lives around, the people that were coming here, and you know what they did? They want, they want to nitpick. They totally ignored what God was doing and said, why aren't your disciples washing their hands like all the other elders, like all the, the uh, religious tradition says? Brothers and sisters, don't read that and say, oh, Pharisees. We do this. This is the human heart. We're very capable of doing this ourselves all the time. We, we human beings, we make up rules that we're, usually these rules are things that we're comfortable with following, and then we use them to grade other people. We very rarely make rules that we have a hard time meeting uh, because the reason we make these rules is to accomplish a couple things. One, when humans make religious rules, like, uh, Sean, you're looking awesome wearing a tie today. Sean could start to think, he could start to think, you know, religious people will wear a tie. A good person will wear a tie. So then Sean's the only person feeling uh, wearing a tie right now, so he's thinking, well, I'm rocking it. I'm the most spiritual person in this room, and, and the girls never wear ties, so I'm way better than them. And, uh, and this would be an example of taking a human rule. It's not in the Bible, thou shalt wear ties. And he would take a human rule and then judge other people with it, and it accomplishes a couple things. One, it makes him feel superior, and then it puts him in a position to look down, secondly, on other people. So he elevates himself and he diminishes other people based on his human-made rule. 
and the Pharisees were missing. Jesus Christ was healing people. The blessing of God was being poured out. Wonderful things were happening. And they're looking at who's washing their hands. They're nitpicking because that's how they made themselves feel secure in their religiosity. We're religious. We do the right things. And your disciples don't. Building themselves up, knocking other people down, missing what the Holy Spirit is doing. Missing what God the Father is doing on earth. Missing what the Son is accomplishing right in front of their eyes. Okay, let's go to verse 3 now, chapter 15 from, from verse 3. Jesus replied, and think now, as we're reading all this, what kind of church do we want to have? Because human nature, if we're not striving for grace, to embrace God's grace for us and having grace for other people, guess what? Pharisee. We're all going to become little Pharisees. From verse 3, Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your traditions? So big important people, and Jesus was not going to mince words with them. Jesus was going to tell them, listen guys. So he's speaking to these important people that came up from Jerusalem. So they said, your disciples don't wash your hands. He says, and why are you guys breaking the commands of God so you can uphold your human traditions? For God said, honor your father and mother. God said it. And anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. That's the Old Testament. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father and mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father and mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. You hypocrites. So here's what was happening. Uh, the Bible says that you're supposed to take care of your parents. The New Testament says that a, a Christian that doesn't take care of his elderly parents is worse than a heathen, worse than an unbeliever. We're supposed to take care of our parents. We're supposed to honor our parents. And these people had this thing going on where they were supposed to spend money for their parents, but then they would say, you know what? I devoted that money to God. And so they'd take that money and fulfill their tithe. You know, they'd pay their money off at the temple, and then they'd say, well, I don't have any money left for my, to take care of my folks. Well, they were supposed to take care of their duty at the temple, and they were supposed to take care of their folks, but they were denying their parents to say, oh, my money went to church. Isn't that so religious? Isn't that so religious? Mom and Dad, I know I haven't called you in months, but I've really got to spend some time in prayer and uh, washing my hair this evening. You know? Make it sound religious. Look at how spiritual I am. I'm giving all my money to the church. So, sorry, Mom, Dad, I can't cover you. can't help you. Isn't that horrible? When God in heaven wants to have a relationship with you and I, God could have just made us and we'd be like animals, we'd be oblivious. God made us with minds and hearts and he wants, he loves us. He loves us enough to sacrifice himself for us and he wants us to care about his things and love his things. And instead, we say, no, I don't want to love the living God. I want to have a bunch of things I can check off and okay, now I'm spiritual, now I'm religious. And instead of having a relationship with the living God that transforms and changes me, who I am is now different because I know God. Instead of that, I'm going to do religious things so I can look spiritual, feel superior, judge other people, and get out of my duties for taking care of my folks. Using religion, using even God's name to build myself up. True religion should knock us on our knees before the living God and say, Oh, Lord. Save me. Human religion builds us up. The religion of God is always going to seek out our sin and have us fall down in reliance upon grace. Human religion always is going to put the spotlight right on ourselves. I want you to also notice that Jesus quotes these verses about uh, you shouldn't curse your parents. And they could say, well, we didn't curse them. We didn't curse them. We, just, we didn't say, we hope you die. We hope you burn. We, we didn't swear at them or anything. But Jesus looked beyond just the letter of the law. You know, a sign of legalism is you just want, what's the minimum? What's the league? You know, just, 
Jesus goes beyond the letter of the law to the intent of the law. The law was supposed to transform us. The law had several purposes. One was to lead us to God so we know we need grace. But it's also to show us God's heart, show us his will. And, and it should be changing us on the inside. The law was never been, meant to be one of those things, okay, tell me the minimum so, so I can get by, so I can check this off and I can feel righteous about it. The law is always about our heart. It's always about being holy. One of those words that Americans don't use much. Holy in word, holy in deed, holy in thought. The law, didn't, the law said, don't curse your parents. And Jesus said, failing to bless them when it's within your power to do so is failure to fulfill the law. See, he took, he took just the bare minimum of it and he extrapolated. He says, this is what it means. It's about your heart. The law said, don't commit adultery. So a lot of people could say, hey, look at me. I'm really, really good because I've never committed. And Jesus taught that even looking, someone, look, even looking at someone with lust in your heart is committing adultery with them in your mind, breaking the law. The law says, do not murder. And you say, okay, I guess I'm righteous. I never murdered anybody. And Jesus said, to harbor heart, hate in your heart. You just can't stand this person. You are killing them in your heart. And it makes us guilty of breaking God's holy law. You see how Jesus wasn't a legalist? He didn't take just check, check, check. He says, now this is what it means. This is why you need the cross. This is why you need grace. And God's standard isn't the bare minimum. God's standard is so high and so beautiful and so far above us. The Adams Clark commentary said of the Pharisees, what frivolous nonsense. These Pharisees had nothing which their malice could fasten on the conduct or doctrine of our blessed Lord and his disciples. That means they, couldn't, they didn't have anything on Jesus and the disciples. Their hatred couldn't latch on anything because their behavior was so good. And therefore, they must dispute the washing of hands. What nonsense. It would be like leaving a church and saying, well, I don't have any doctrinal issues, but I hate that you have drums. Or, or, or I don't have any doctrinal issues, but, but I hate that the, the carpet is green. Join the club on that. but uh, it's, You see what I'm saying? It's not, it's, it's not that these are big, huge things. You don't, they didn't, the Pharisees didn't have anything. What frivolous nonsense they started to nitpick because all they wanted to do was use religion to build themselves up and knock other people down. All sorts of Pharisees are troublesome people in religious society. You like, kind of like the way the old timers talk, right? All sorts of Pharisees are troublesome people in religious society. And the reason is they take more pleasure in blaming others than in amending themselves. Amending, looking at them, getting ourselves right before holy God. Okay, let's uh, go on from, from verse 7. Jesus Christ, that warm, fuzzy, gentle guy that uh, he's kind of got big, huge, cute eyes and he... He usually kind of wears a pinkish, bluish kind of combination. He said, oh, you fellas. No. He said, you hypocrites. You hypocrites. You know, don't read that and think in the old days people like to be called hypocrites, but not now. No. That's a challenge to our pride, isn't it? Haven't we been seeing the entire book of Matthew? God is challenging the religion of self. You hypocrites. Isaiah, the prophet, and Jesus knew him personally, right? Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people will honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Brothers and sisters, do we want Foundation Church to be a place that God looks down from heaven and says, wow, they're saying all the right things, they're singing all the right songs, they're doing all the right things, but their heart is not with me. They're just going through religious motions. Wouldn't that be tragic? For God to look down and say, no, their heart is not with me. They're not loving me. They're not loving the lost. They're not loving one another. They're not quick to forgive. They're bitter and hard and holding on to grudges. God says, their heart's not with me. These people, these people, he doesn't say my kids. You know, it's kind of one of those things when you're upset. But These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Heavenly Father, 
uh, we're so messed up sometimes, and we can be so petty and childish and cynical, and, and we can hold on to grudges and bitterness, and we can feel slighted and all these things, Lord. Father, please rescue us from that. Lord, we don't want our worship of you to be in vain. Lord, it's our desire and our hope that, Lord, you look down from heaven and you're pleased. Father, we want to love you, but we're so weak. Help us to love you more. And help us, Father, by being patient with people that are difficult. And help us to love people that maybe aren't loving us. Father, help us to just to have an attitude to be blessings to others, to build up the people around us, to bring hope, joy, peace, your cross, Lord God. We want to be your people in everything. Please save us from an empty, vain, meaningless, pointless religion. We pray in your name. Amen. I don't want to have that kind of church. I don't want to have a church where everybody's looking around, looking at somebody, something to criticize. You know, I, I once read in Islam that so, some Muslims were arguing about their length of their pants, uh, how, long, how many inches from the ground the pant leg could be. We do not want a church where we're always checking everybody else to see if they measure up to our standards. What a sad, miserable, ornery, nasty church that would be. And that's not what Jesus Christ has called us for. Where was I? Oh yeah, verse 9. From verse 8 again. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Uh, there's something very obvious here. A mere religion, just being religious, doesn't please God. And brothers and sisters, we have to watch out for that because many times when somebody has a sick relative or something, I'll, my first question is almost always, right, are they right with the Lord? How are they doing with Jesus? And usually the answer I get is, well, they go to church, or sometimes they go to church. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is coming down on empty religion. Just being religious, just going through the rituals doesn't get us right with God. Just going through some religious ceremony, washing your hands, whatever, doesn't get us right with God. Mere religion doesn't please God. It's also very possible. It's possible to be very religious, come to church every Sunday, do all the right things, and we don't have God's heart. And all of our religion will be in vain according to God. This is not something... Pastor Dan is making up. We just read it together right out of the scriptures. And if we do that, guess what? This great relationship about a God who created an entire universe and yet would come down and die for us, come down on this little planet and suffer at the hands of his creation, guess what? When we're doing man-made religion, we miss out on this wonderful relationship with God. And our religion has no power. It's drudgery. It's orneriness. It's critical, it's judgmental, it's self-righteous, and it's empty, according to God. God has something so much better for us, to know God, to love God, to have his heart become part of our hearts, become our heart, and we love other people. Let's continue on now from verse 10. Jesus called to the crowd and said, listen and understand. Anybody sleeping? I'm reading Jesus' words. Listen and understand. You know, don't be one of those guys that just gets excited about the red, stu red letter stuff in your Bible. See, I got red here. But, honestly, this is Jesus Christ talking right now. Jesus Christ said this 2,000 years ago, and it's for us today. Listen and understand. What goes into your mouth does not defile you. What? All those Old Testament rules about eating and everything? What goes into your mouth does not defile you, but what comes out of your mouth, the things you say, that is what defiles you. And we mess ourselves up by saying mean, nasty, rotten things about people and to people. Then the disciples came to him and asked, uh, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard you say this? Uh, Jesus, you don't know, but these important guys from Jerusalem... That part about being hypocrites actually offended them. They were pretty ticked off. And she said, oh, really? You know, why, why did they have to say that to him? Do you know that the Pharisees were, were offended at this? He replied, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted 
will be pulled up by its roots. This is again Jesus declaring and speaking with authority. There's a lot of religious things out there. A lot of churches, a lot of religious people, if it's not planted by the Lord God, it will be pulled up by its roots. I don't want that to be anybody in this room. I don't want that to be us. Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by its roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both are going to fall into a pit. And you know what? As much as I, you, heard me, you hear me all the time, that health, wealth, welfare gospel, that televangelism, that name it, claim it stuff, what we can't, that's not a true gospel. It's a false gospel. Guess what? It's, it's okay to be angry at the televangelists, but all the people that are following them, they're not innocent. They're not innocent. They're hearing what their itchy ears want to hear. And it's the blind leading the blind. They're not innocent. Jesus says, leave them. My Heavenly Father is going to uproot all that. Peter said, explain the parable to us. And again, you know, I don't get the, get the disciples sometimes. Sometimes they don't ask about parables that I want to know. And sometimes they ask about easy ones. And I'm thinking, hey, Peter, come on, man. But anyways, uh, it's in Scripture, so here's... And so I wonder if Jesus had the same feeling. Like, come on, guys. Because listen to the way he answers it. The first time he says, it's not what goes in, but what comes out of your mouth. So, so Peter says, can you explain that to us? He says, are you still so dull? You, you, you're not getting that? That's verse 16. I'm not making this up. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked him. Don't you see that whatever goes into the mouth goes into the stomach and then comes out the backside? I think he got a little crude there because, wait, wait, you guys are not getting this? You poop it out. What goes in the mouth goes in the stomach. This is not what defiles your soul. But the things that come out of your mouth, the things you say, they come from your heart. And these things will mess you over. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are the things that will defile you, children. But eating with unwashed hands is not going to defile you. We get so hung up on religious ritual. We get so hung up on if I do this, if I do that. We want to have a nice simple checklist. And Jesus says, I want to know what's going on in your heart. What's going on in your soul? What person are you? Is a relationship with God making any difference in the way we talk, in the way that we think, the way we treat other people? These are the things that God is concerned about. Theologian Matthew Henry, another one of those awesome old timers, said, when Christ teaches, he will show men the deceitfulness and wickedness of their own hearts. That's how you know the difference between a false teacher. And I told you there's, there's a huge church in America that won't talk about sin, won't talk about hell because they don't want to offend anybody. When Christ teaches, he shows men the deceitfulness of their own heart. My heart is going to trick me. He shows men the wickedness of their own hearts. He will teach them to humble themselves and to seek to be cleansed in the fountain open for sin and uncleanliness. And Jesus Christ is a fountain, and his grace just covers me, and I come in, and Lord, I need forgiveness. I'm washed free by the blood. Just all the nastiness washed away because God is so good. And Jesus Christ, on the cross, he died for every single thing I've ever thought, said, or done, every time I've hurt people around me, every time people who trusted me and I betrayed them, every time I, somebody, every time I've let people down, every time I've thought horrible things, every time I've done things that, are, that a child of God should never do, Jesus Christ says, Dan, I took all that. I took it all. Thank you, Jesus. And he just pours out his grace on us, and it's just like one of those hot, sticky days, you know, when you jump in a pool or something, you just, ah. Oh, Everything it just washes away. And Jesus Christ's blood washes away all of the darkness in our hearts, all the rottenness in our, in our souls. His blood covers all our sin, past sins, present sins, future sins. It's all washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. We come to the fountain opened by Jesus Christ on that cross, and he will forgive our sins. He will forgive you, and if you don't believe God can forgive you, that's because you think your sin is greater than his grace, and that's pride. Repent. Repent. All right, let's get real practical. Who's Christ? God in flesh. God come down to earth. 
We saw God is waging this war on human self-righteousness. Here's what God wants us to know this morning. God, Christ, observed that the Pharisees break God's commands for the sake of human tradition. Okay, in our context, what are some commands that we might ignore because of our own rules, because of human tradition, by the way my parents did it, the way American culture does it? Well, American consumer culture and this me-first mentality uh, can have a skip tithing. We talked about that this morning. We can skip tithing. We can reject God, ordained authority, and participation in church events uh, can get pretty spotty just to pander to our own flesh. We end up doing things God. We, uh, we end up not doing things God's way, because let's face it. Turn on the turn on the uh, commercials on television. Our culture is not a friend to Christianity. Our culture has different values and priorities than God has. Uh, so we buy into the values and priorities of our culture. We find that our priorities look pretty much like the unsaved guys at work. Wait, <laughs> that shouldn't be. The things we value look pretty much like our neighbors. Wait, that shouldn't be. And we're not being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Well, that's pretty obvious, but, but I want to cut out the, the non-believing world for a moment right now and just talk about what are some of the religious things that we do. Like the Pharisees were really religious guys, right? And God says, you're religious, but you're missing it. You guys are missing the boat. So what are some religious things that we do that can actually keep us in a bad place in our relationship with God, can keep us from being obedient to God. Well, I mean, we could make up a super long list, and I don't want to spend time on this. I'm going to go quickly. How about not singing, because I don't like that song. Or not singing because I grew up with, with, uh, with uh, hymns. Thank you. I grew up with hymns, and that's the way we're going to sing it. Or, or I grew up and we did all Southern Baptist gospel, and so that's the only. Or I grew up in the inner city, and that's the way to sing. Or, or I grew up and there was only guitar, or I grew up and there was only an organ, or I grew up and there was only piano, or I grew up and there was a, uh, this awesome 20-piece uh, worship. And so we don't allow ourselves to worship the living God because it doesn't match our expectations. Let's, real quick, let's go to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. There's so many different ones we could have used, but I'm going to use Psalm 100 because it's short. How we sing the worship music we have should never be a reason for breaking fellowship with God's people, leaving a church, uh, starting division in the church. Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates. Come to church with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for God is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. We human beings can miss out on singing praises to God because we're hung up on the way we think things should be. And we miss it. We're like the Pharisees, nitpicking. Brothers and sisters, let's not go there. Let's not do that. How sad. How about uh, not reaching out, not loving people? And I've heard, I've heard of this before. Brothers and sisters, I've heard of of places of churches where we don't want to bring in those kind of people. We don't want to bring in somebody who's a prostitute. We don't want to bring in somebody who's struggling with alcoholism. We don't want to bring in somebody. We don't want to because we want this to be a place where we can raise our families. And so we're going to deny the great commission of God. He said, go out to all people, to all nations. Teach them to obey. Teach, bring them into the family. And we're, we instead, we want a safe little holy huddle. So we're going to exclude people that we're not comfortable with so we can build up a bunch of clones. Show me. Show me. Because your attitude, your heart is wrong. Jesus Christ died for the lost, and then we're going to just collect ourselves and, and make a nice safe little place? How foreign to the heart of God. What a betrayal of the heart of God. 
He loves us. Let's get out there and start loving people. And let's bring everybody in. It's a big house. There's enough room for everybody in God's family. We don't want a bunch of clones, and that's from Matthew uh, chapter 28. How about, uh, how about this? Supporting various ministries and missionaries. Good thing. So I'm supporting uh, different ministries and missionaries. Therefore, I can't support my local church. Even though that's all our responsibility to support our local church, that the Bible teaches that uh, we must share every good thing with those who teach us. So you do have an out. If you can say, oh, this guy never teaches me anything, maybe technically you don't have to give. I don't know. That's between you and God. Uh, but uh, if you are being blessed in a church and you're part of that church body, you're expected to participate and be a part of it. Uh, and don't say, well, I'm doing other religious good things, just like the Pharisees. They weren't going to help their parents because they were giving to the temple. Jesus said, don't give to the temple. Do both. Take care of your responsibilities and take care of your responsibilities. How about, how about our religious clothes? And the, and the uniform is going to look different. You know, I used to wear this thing with, with black robes. And um, I had a missionary tell me I look like the angel of death, you know. <laughs> Which, the kind of pastor I am, I liked that, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but what's your religious uniform? Well, I, go, I come to church, and this is the way I dress. I've, I've got to have khakis and loafers. Or, or I come to church, and I'm always wearing a suit with, with the vest. Or I come to church, and I don't have to look like that. I'm not putting on a performance for anywhere. I'm going to wear, what are you, my holy jeans and holy T-shirt, and I'm really holy then, and uh, my socks have holes too. Uh, you know what? Usually, the way we think is the Sunday way to dress is the way, usually the way we're comfortable dressing during the week but then we spiritualize it so we can look down at the people who don't dress like us. Does that sound like that nitpicking kind of thing? Uh, show me a guy that loves to dress up suit and tie. He, maybe he goes to work in a suit and tie. He just feels sharp. He feels competent wearing a shoot and, suit and tie, the whole bit. But for missionary purposes, in whatever community he's at, he's going to wear T-shirts and jeans every week. And he's doing it as a sacrifice for the kingdom of God, I'm going to be impressed with that man. And he's not going to feel superior about it where he dresses t-shirts and you look at me, I can dress down. No. Or show me a guy that only dresses casual all the time. He, he hates putting on a tie. But for ministry purposes, he's going to dress up and he's going to, he's going to put the uniform on and again, he's not feeling religious or superior about it. Guys, the songs we sing, the clothes we wear, the way we talk, let's be careful careful not to take what we're comfortable with it, make it a rule, and thereby judge and critique and grade other people in a way that elevates ourselves and diminishes other people. Let's be very, very careful. Let's not be like the Pharisees about this stuff. Brothers and sisters, we are the body in this local church. We make what kind of church foundation is going to be. And I hope when people come to church here, they find a lot of love, and they don't find a lot of people nitpicking, trying to figure out exactly uh, how you measure up. The kind of music we sing, what kind of hairstyles are okay, these are matters of conscience. These are matters of conscience. Let each person stand before God. There's a famous quote repeated by many theologians, including John Wesley. It's a beautiful quote. Uh, In essentials, unity. This is the word of God. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Heaven's doors are open. Everybody can go to heaven if they'll humble themselves and accept this grace. These are essential. These are hills we die on. We can't compromise on these because then we lose the heart of the gospel. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, or in some translations say, in doubtful matters, liberty. There's a lot of things here like, like uh, how do we work that out? How does that work out? Uh, I have a conviction. Maybe you have a conviction that you shouldn't have a pumpkin on Halloween because a pumpkin could be a, a monster face, and we don't want to teach kids monster faces. Uh, and so you're not going to have a pumpkin. That's between you and God. But be careful not to run around saying, oh, they think they're Christians and they have pumpkins? Don't do that. 
Now, if you think having a pumpkin on your front porch is going to be a front to, a front to God, and I come over to your house and I see like 30 pumpkins there, I'm thinking, wow, there's a big problem here. This man's in outward rebellion. But if you own a pumpkin patch and I come over to your house and you have 100 pumpkins that are sitting around, I say, wow, you got a good crop this year. Awesome. You see? It's a heart and our attitude towards the law. In, a, in non essentials liberty. In all things, charity. Isn't that beautiful? In all things, charity. And it's not, not the idea of charity giving money away. This is like, I'm going to be gracious towards you and you're going to be gracious towards me. We're not going to be hypercritical with one another. In all things, charity. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. And that's a pretty cool way to run a church. The Bible puts it this way in Romans 14.4. Who are you to judge another man's servant? See, if you're a believer of Jesus Christ, you are a servant of the living God. We're all servants. And so we look over, and but God says, who are, who are you? Who do you think you are? That one's mine. You don't judge my servant. I judge my servant. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And there's more we could go into and talk about. And if you have any questions, feel free to talk with me. Uh, there's a role for the, el the elders, the leadership for creating culture in a church. And there's, there's verses like uh, that a woman must dress modestly. That's going to change from generation to generation. That will even change from church to church. If you have a church that's on the beach and you have a beachfront ministry, you're going to have different standards than we're going to have. And we might have stricter standards in some churches, but our standards are not going to be as strict as other churches. The trick is we're not going to feel superior to other Christians because the way we do it. We have a culture, a mentality. God gives that role to the, to the elders, to the pastors in the church to say this is going to be the community, this is going to be our cultural expectations, but let's not take those and say, now these are essential matters, and boy, I hate the way they do things over at that church or that church, or why do they sing with an organ over there, or why do they use uh, rap music over there? We're not going to do that. We have our culture, we have our ways of doing things, but we're not going to judge other Christians by our standards. Before we close, technically, i got to tell you something. Technically, God doesn't hate religion. Technically. Uh, religion that God, our Father, accepts from James 1.27 is pure and faultless. Religion that God really likes is to do this, to look after orphans, to look after widows, people in distress, and to keep yourselves pure from being corrupted by our godless world. So the television can corrupt you, the internet can corrupt you, uh, the, your friends uh, who are living for themselves and have worldly values, all this. The Bible says keep yourself from being polluted by any of that garbage. This is a religion that God, this is real religion. So what we were angry about is not real religion, which is a relationship with God. It's this, actually when I said I hate, what I hate is replacing true religion with a sham of man-made religion based on self-righteousness. Amen? We don't want to miss out on a true uh, religion, a true relationship with God because of our self-built, uh, self-righteous religions. Because when we use religion as window dressing, I realized when I wrote this sermon, I don't know what window dressing means. <laughs> Is it drapes or blinds or something? But, you know, window dressing just means you're trying to look good. It's just something on the outside. So... Be, when we use religion just to make ourselves look good to others, or we even trick ourselves into thinking we are good because we can check, 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 we believe in our own goodness, we're missing out on all that God has for us. We don't want to miss it. We want to have the blessings, and we want to bring people into the blessings. We can be, brothers and sisters, Foundation Bible Church, we can be a church that loves God. We can be a church that loves one another. Or we can be some religious club where we sit around and feel superior to one another. And we're always looking at each other to tear each other down. And when a new person comes in there, we're always looking at them with these kind of proud eyes, looking down at them so they're not comfortable. That pushes people away from God, causes division, causes heartache, and we make ourselves miserable. That's the choice. Relationship with God human self-righteous religion. That's the choice. It's always in my heart. It's the choice for our church. We have to make this choice decision daily as the years go by. Uh, may the Lord bless us with uh, making the right choice. So let's pray real quick. Let's close our eyes and pray. Father, here we are, and uh, your word is making sense to us, Lord. 
we don't want to take our human rules and make ourselves miserable and use them to, to judge other people, Lord. Father, instead, let's hold tight on the essentials. Let's have charity. Let's have grace when we disagree on some of the doubtful matters. And Lord, we just pray that you stir up within us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, for goodness, for holiness. Father, you are our Father. We want to be the children, the sheep of your pasture. Thank you, God, for all the blessings you've given us. Stir within us thankful hearts, we pray. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.